Okay, in this video we're going to look at calculating the arc lengths of a curve C determined by a vector valued function. And here we have a specific interval for that vector valued function. So this curve would have a starting point at t equals a, whatever the terminal point of this vector is when t equals a would be the starting point of the curve, and then an ending point at t equals b. And so what we want to do is think about how we would come up with a formula for calculating this arc length, but ultimately you want to just be able to write this formula down so that you can use it to do the calculations in your homework and on a test and whatever else. So uh, let's think a little bit about this though. So I'm just going to draw a curve here. I'm going to just draw mine in the surface of the screen here. So it's not really a space curve, just a plane curve here. And I'm going to give it an orientation and this t equals a would correspond to the starting point of my curve and t equals b the ending point of my curve. Okay, and so back in calculus 2, you probably did arc length of y equals f of x curves, parametric curves in two dimension, and polar curves as well. And so the idea is the same, uh, but just to kind of refresh that, the idea is you're going to take this curve and you're going to partition the curve into little pieces. So you're going to chop it up into little pieces and you're going to have t values associated with each of those endpoints. So you're going to chop that all up into little pieces and then you calculate a length on each piece. So I'm going to basically use a little distance formula to calculate the length of an individual little piece here. And so distance formula in three dimensions, I've got square root of, I would have the change in x, the difference between the x coordinates of those two points squared, uh, plus the change in y squared, plus the change in z squared. All right, so that's just distance formula. And then the basic idea here, the reason I've used a k here is because I have different distances on different pieces here. So we'd calculate all those distances, we would add them all up, and uh, then in order to get an integral formula, we're going to take the limit as the norm of some partition approaches zero. All right, so if I add all these up, I don't technically get a Riemann sum. Uh, you have to do a little bit of symbolic manipulation to get a Riemann sum. So I'm going to uh, factor out a delta t, the quantity squared, from here. So you did this in calculus two, whether you wrote it down or not. Um, but you'll have delta x over delta t squared and delta y over delta t squared and delta z over delta t squared and then a delta t factored out from that. So that delta t is outside the radical here. So you can think algebraically if I distribute this back in, I would square that and distribute that back through and I would get what I have here. Uh, I'm going to add all those up over the whole curve. So I'm going to let k equal 1 to n, where n is the number of pieces that I've chopped the curve into. I'm going to take the limit as the norm of that partition approaches 0. And provided this limit exists and is the same for all my choices of partition and points in, my, in each little piece here, then we get an integration formula. So I'm not going to ask you to go through this, but if you can connect your ideas in your head and understand that the integration formula that we're going to come up with is based on distance formula, it'll help you remember that formula and not have to struggle to think about what that formula is. All right, so um, there are a couple of conditions I need to ensure that this Riemann sum will converge to an actual limit when I take the limit of that as the norm of that partition approaches zero. Uh, I need my R of T parameterization to be smooth, at least on the interior of the interval from A to B. It does not necessarily have to be smooth at the endpoints at T equals A and T equals B. And I also want my curve C to not intersect itself on the interior of that interval.
So the curve could intersect itself at t equals a, t equals b if it comes back around and loops back to the same starting point. If it starts at the point and then ends at that same point, it might intersect itself at that end point. But on the interior of that interval, we don't want that to, to intersect itself. So provided these things are true, then we can get an arc length formula. Uh, we have a Riemann sum here, so our arc length formula is going to be an integral. I'm going to use L for arc length. And I'm going to integrate from t equals a to t equals b. That would be our starting and ending values corresponding with our curve here. And then the integral formula here. So there are different ways that you might think about writing this. I tend to think about it in terms of distance formula. So I tend to write it using dx dt and dy dt and dz dt. Whoops, this should be y. Um, so this integral gives the length of that curve, arc length, or length of that curve. So I tend to think about it this way, um, where our x, y, and z come from these component functions from our vector-valued function. You might also see it written, I think our textbook likes to write it like this, from t equals a to t equals b square root of. So if x is f of t, then dx dt would be f prime of t. This is just different notation for the same thing. Uh, squared plus g prime of t squared plus h prime of t squared. Uh, sometimes I see students try to use this and they'll just use f, g, and h instead of f prime, g prime, and h prime. That's why I think connecting it to this idea of distance formula, change in x, change in y, change in z, is sometimes helpful because then if you think about it that way, you're going to be thinking about change in, and so you won't accidentally use the wrong uh, thing here in the argument of your square root. Uh, another way that this sometimes is written, so if I have r of t given by f, g, and h, then I also have r prime of t, or v of t, given by f prime, g prime, and h prime. And uh, if you think about that and look at this, you might notice that this looks like a magnitude of a vector. So sometimes you'll also see this written, uh, the integral from t equals a to t equals b. And here we'll have magnitude of v of t. This is a kind of handy shorthand way to write this formula. Uh, all three of these are just different representations of the same exact formula. I tend to think about this one because I think about distance formula. It makes it easier for me to remember. Um, but if you're writing this down and using it in some other way, uh, sometimes you might want to write it this way. It's just a little bit shorter notation to use. All right, in the next example, we'll look at actually calculating arc length for a specific example and just kind of turning through the steps and doing the integration.